Hi, everybody, and welcome to Avoiding Summer Slide, our webinar for this week. My name is Ruth Rumack, and I am the Executive Director of Education at Ruth Rumack's Learning Space. And we are an academic support company. We work with students of all ages, at all grades from K to 12 and beyond. Um, we work with a lot of students who have particular learning needs, as well as uh, different attention and focus challenges, perhaps some students on the autism spectrum, um, and a wide variety of needs in between, everything from enrichment through to remedial. So I would love to give you a little more information about us, um, the fact that we have one-on-one -on -one support for students. We craft every single lesson specifically for the needs of that child, and all of our teachers are certified teachers. The other really important thing to know is that we have moved online, and we are able to provide all of our services, including the one-to-one -one and group classes, with live teachers, real live teachers, providing feedback in real time. So, um, you know, if you have any particular needs and you want to talk to me afterwards, I will stay online. Feel free to send information through the chat uh, as well as to um, talk to your other um, attendees because I think the whole purpose of these parent workshops or parent webinars was really to build a community and to make that um, that community really sing in terms of helping to support each other and to be there for each other, especially during these times. So. Let's move on to the next slide. We're here to talk about summer slide. And, you know, here we are in a very, very strange time um, in that, you know, we've had our kids home for more than two months now. We have varying degrees of uh, classroom teacher interaction. Some of our students are getting a ton, a ton of work to do, and they've got lots of interaction with their classroom teachers. Some of our students are getting very little interaction with their classroom teachers, and it's making that motivation to stay engaged and to stay on top of their work very, very difficult. Um, so today we're going to talk about some things that we can do that are offline. And as we look forward to even nicer weather, today was a beautiful day, but if we look forward to the summer and knowing that there won't be the structure of school, a lot of parents are asking me, well, what do I do? Oh my goodness, we've got another two months coming up through the summer. What are we going to do? So we've got lots of ideas uh, for you, and these are practical ideas, things that you can implement right away. Um, some of them don't take any material at all. Some of them are using things that you can gather around the house. Um, and we've tried to keep them really fun and engaging and talking about, you know, how much academics do you want to push over the summer versus how much free time do you want to give your kids? Now, before we go on, I would like to know, if it's possible for each of you just to put into the chat box the grades of the kids that you have at home or the, the kids that you're thinking of, because then it'll help me to kind of streamline what it is that, um, you know, what is it we're talking about. So go ahead, take a moment, and just if you can type in what grades um, you are thinking of. And I am going to, oh, we've got a grade one and a grade seven. All right. That's a very, that's a big switch, uh, a big, a big difference. And that takes some strategic planning on the parents' part because it means that you're going to have to focus one type of learning for your younger child and a different type of activity or learning for your older child. So we can talk about that as well. How about anybody else? What have we got? A grade three, Sharon says we've got a grade three student and a grade five student who also has a diagnosis of dyslexia. So that adds a little bit more information and helps me as well. Um, anybody else? Excellent. All right, well, we're going to go with that. So we've got grade one, grade three, grade five, and grade seven. Oh, that's funny. They're all odd numbers. Um, let's continue. Okay, I've got to get my screen back to the way that it's supposed to look. What have I done to it? I'm not sure. Hang on one second. Give me a moment. And I'm, there we go. Okay, uh, let's talk about summer. And we actually want to talk about what Summer Slide is because Summer Slide is a real thing. It's a recognized, researched 
thing that happens when students take the break from the summer starting at the end of June and that time period between June and September. And students can lose an average of two to three months worth of the gains that they have made within the school year. So when we talk about summer slide, you know, we're talking about not the fact that there is learning going on all the time. And no matter what you do, you know, as a human being in the world, you're going to be learning things. But we're talking specifically about language skills, reading skills, particularly reading speed and fluency, comprehension, as well as math. And that those are the two big areas that we see quite a decline. And we know that this happens because you spend or a teacher spends the first three to six weeks of the school year doing um, a recovery or doing a review of what was supposed to be covered in the last few months of the year previous. Now this year it's going to be very different. Uh, you know, speaking to so many of my colleagues and friends at the school boards and at private schools who are in the classrooms preparing for September, they know that September is going to be a very different year than we've ever had. Um, and so we have to prepare for it. Part of our job as parents can be preparing our kids to be able to be ready to go back to school as well. So I want to take a step backwards and, you know, ask how you guys are doing with your kids at home and how that motivation is, is, uh, is, is it peaking? Have we peaked? Have we kind of lost our motivation? Where are you guys at? And I would love some answers in the chat as well in terms of how you're feeling and how things are going. In speaking with different parents, every family has different needs. And what I'm hearing is that some families have just had it up to here with the online learning. Their kids aren't motivated. They're not engaged. And they're throwing it out the window. Other families, uh, particularly from schools or teachers who are more strategic and more structured, they're actually doing well. And some of those kids who may have been distracted or had high anxiety in the classroom are actually faring much better being at home and being in a controlled environment. So it really just depends on, on each child's needs and where they're coming from. Um, so let's talk about getting away from the computer work because it will probably be a nice change to take a, a moment and take some time and get outside and enjoy what summer has to offer. Um, the other piece to, to consider, of course, is that we as parents may still be working. We still have needs that we have to or responsibilities that we have to take care of. And so how do we balance that just letting the kids go free but also giving them some structure and some strategy in order to be prepared to re-enter the classroom or whatever that classroom is going to look like in September. I would say take the lead from your kids. Let their curiosity really drive where you go with it. Um, you know, some of the things that we like to do together as a family may serve learning purposes as well. And all of the different types of games and board games and strategy games, uh, those are things that will also help to build skills. All right, Nicole says... Um, what have we got here? One good thing is that their school has been doing full structured days. Yes, lucky you. However, as the weather gets nicer, we have hit a plateau and it's a bit more of a fight to complete work. I hear you. I completely hear you. I feel the same way. I mean, it's nice to be able to take my Zoom calls out on the deck or, or on, you know, on the front, in the front yard instead of being inside the house. So we hear that. And in fact, this is the natural time in the classroom where our kids start to get a little bit rangy anyway. And we feel as teachers in a large classroom that the kids are ready to be outside. You know, it's hard to keep them focused even in the bigger structured system. So if teachers are providing some structure and that's sticking, that's wonderful. Um, now we've got some ideas in order to give you some, some, some feedback, but also some good ammunition in terms of preparing for the summer. All right, take, uh, let's take a look. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, so when we look at the research and the benefits of learning online, um, or sorry, not online, but outside, we are looking at the decrease in stress and anxiety, how being outside, how being in nature, being surrounded by trees and leaves and, you know, intake of oxygen and fresh air, these are things that actually decrease stress. Um, we also know that when a kid is outside and they've got more room to move, it encourages them to move, which of course is great for physical activity. And we also know there's a strong correlation between physical activity and 
keeping the exercise going and the brain power that we have to put towards something afterwards. So for a lot of our kids that have um, focus and attention challenges, we often suggest that they exercise between 20 and 30 minutes of some good vigorous exercise, a bike ride, jumping on the trampoline, um, even doing jumping jacks for a few minutes at a time stimulates the the hormones and the brain chemicals that we need in order to actually stay focused. So the more you're outside, the more focus that your child may actually have. Um, we also know that being outdoors helps with hands-on experiences in nature. And so many of our kids really learn best by doing and by being uh, and by getting their hands dirty and figuring things out for themselves. It also helps discovery. Um, and talks about improving self-discipline and especially, you know, when reading is a challenge or when writing is a challenge or organizing your thoughts is a challenge, being outside and having that opportunity to be freer with what you're doing also has a significant impact on child uh, self-esteem and confidence. So one of, the, one of the nicer things about it is also that it improves environmental awareness. And, you know, as we are all uh, stewards of the planet, it's nice to give kids the opportunity to really dive into what's out there in nature and so that they have a stronger affinity and a stronger connection with the outdoors and will therefore hopefully preserve it for themselves and the next generations. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. Any questions so far? If there's anything that you want clarification on or something comes to mind, please feel free to put it in the chat. All right, these are just some pictures, some different things. They are, you know, the pictures look a little bit younger for younger kids, but they're definitely things that will, um, can be extended through even into high school. And in a few moments, we're going to talk about some very specific things for each grade level or groups of grade levels. So, you know, Backyard, your backyard, if you live in an apartment or a condo, the park near you, we are so fortunate in Toronto to have so many public spaces and green spaces, uh, but just taking the time to build something, to plant something, to investigate, just taking, uh, you know, your magnifying glass and going outside and taking a look at all the bugs and the leaves and the trees. We'll talk about that soon. And of course, reading outside, there's really nothing better than finding a nice grassy spot in a, on a sunny, warm afternoon, putting down a blanket and, and having a nice read. So um, lots of other things to do, experiments and getting your hands dirty and being outside, you know, especially at this time, it allows us to get dirty and we don't have to bring it back inside. Let's look at the next slide. So other things that we can look at are being just outdoors in the greater nature, lots of parks and ravines in Toronto and, and you know, all across Canada, um, going on a hike. I've found that that's really been helpful for my daughter. She's in grade five this year. And on the weekends when we have been in the house all week, um, we like to go out and take a, a couple of hours and, and walk through nature and just finding the trails, exploring different trails in the city is, uh, is terrific. It's okay. Ashley says she's got to leave at eight. That's all right. You stay as long as you can. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. Let's talk about primary first. So we've broken things down into primary, which is generally K to, to three, grade three, junior grades, which is grade four to six, and then, um, or even extending a little further to eight, and then into the senior grades, which would be nine to 12. So let's talk first about the primary learning and how we can extend that outdoors. So some, some wonderful um, things about language is that we can play all kinds of language games indoors and outdoors. But when we're outdoors, we have, again, a greater um, ability to get our hands dirty and to really be tactile and kinesthetic in the work that we do. So a couple of quick games, you know, finding words with the same spelling uh, you know, something like we've got the example car, star, park, looking for words uh, with an I spy game, looking for things that have the same sounds in them, or looking for rhyming words in the outdoor environment. Um, one of the things I love to do is practice printing or spelling outdoors in the mud, in the sand, in if you take a, a tray of shaving cream, um, or what I like to do is take a, the, the baking tray, spray it with shaving cream, and then the kids get to write their letters in the shaving cream. Anything that is 
uh, tactile, that is mushy, that has some kind of resistance. When you are practicing your letters in that medium, what's happening is there is, um, you know, neurons are, are being fired from the touch sensors in the finger against whatever you're pulling your finger through that's setting up more learning in the brain. So we talk a lot at Ruth Remax Learning Space about kinesthetic learning and hands-on learning. And this is a perfect example. You can use it to practice uh, letters, just letter formation and starting at the right place and ending at the right place and directionality, but you can also use it for practicing sight words or practicing spelling words. And somebody sent in a question earlier um, earlier in the week asking, how do you make spelling words more fun or, or practicing spelling patterns more fun? And one of the ways we do it is by getting our hands dirty. So if you call out the word and you can either, again, use it with a stick in the sand or your finger in some shaving cream or um, some other soap, even just a soapy, a soapy tray, it really takes the learning off of the page and makes it much more fun. Um, some other suggestions, read a list of make a list of everything that you can see in the garden. So that's a way to practice the language, the vocabulary and spelling, read together under favorite tree or in a hammock. Um, I like to take things and sort of spread them out during the day. So for our little guys, you might want to read a story together about something that has to do with the garden or growing or planting or outdoors or hiking, something like The Very Hungry Caterpillar or The Grouchy Ladybug by Eric Carle, um, and then extend that by looking for caterpillars. You could go and find a caterpillar, maybe even create a habitat for it. We're going to talk about that in our science slide and then continue to watch that caterpillar over time. Um, I love to make stuff with our kids. So concocting and creating, you can make slushy drinks, mud pies, and then take it to the language side of things, which is writing about them. Write down your recipe, write down your steps, which is called procedural reading, uh, writing, which is very important for developing um, sequence and to develop language that tells first, next, and last. Um, Another idea is to make a sight word scavenger hunt and where you hide cards of the sight words throughout the yard. Maybe you have the child look for them first, collect them, and then go to that hands-on idea where they actually rewrite the cards in the soapy tray or on the, you know, in the mud pie, etc. But something that gathers all of the pieces together. All right, let's move on to the next one. So let's talk about counting outdoors. And this again is for the primary years. So counting anything, my goodness, counting flowers, bugs, sidewalk lines, fence posts, trees. Uh, one of one year when my daughter and her cousin were younger, they were probably about five, we were at the park and there was a, a large tree with pine cones that were had fallen, you know, all the pine cones were on the ground. And we made a game of it. We collected as many pine cones as we could in a given set of time. I think I gave them two minutes to collect as many as they could. So they had their giant piles. Then we counted each pile one by one. And then we made a long line of those piles. So we took each pine cone and spread them out as far as we could. And we talked about measurements. So not only we were talking about numbers and you know which pile had more and which had less we could add the two piles together and do some some counting and addition that way we also talked about the difference between the two piles so that would be subtraction and then we took it and made a linear line and measured how many steps it took for each child to count or to to walk from the beginning of the pine cone line to the to the next and truthfully that took about 45 minutes and it was a fabulous activity they were engaged they were active they were having fun they were laughing and giggling. And if you've got more than one child, of course, you can add a little competition in there as long as it's healthy competition. Um, some other ideas for writing numbers and practicing sequence of numbers would be to use sidewalk chalk. Um, measurement is a great thing to do outside. You know, we have one of those long contracting measuring tapes and my daughter loves to go around and, and measure the different things. Maybe not so now, so much now, but I'll get to what I'm doing with my daughter this summer in a little while. But measuring things, taking small rulers and large rulers, um, you know, you can take these things with you and then bring them out wherever you are in the park. Skip counting, a really great skill for those 
grade one, two, and three kids, uh, skip counting by twos and fives and tens. And when you actually use manipulatives, you can, again, gather pine cones, twigs, sticks, whatever you can find, rocks, and uh, you know, lay them out and make the patterns uh, of counting that way. So groups of two, groups of five. Um, taking a ball with you is another way to do it. And we do this a lot at our learning space. We throw the ball back and forth. And as one person catches it, they say the number and then they throw it. And the person who catches it on the other end says the next number in the sequence. So we're taking turns five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Um, if you have a pool, if you're lucky enough to have a pool this summer, it's a great game in the pool. And I know my husband and daughter for years, uh, you know, want to see how far they can get, to what number can they get in terms of back and forth without dropping the ball. And if you're counting by twos or fives or tens, it makes it seem like a much bigger number than it actually is. Um, another thing that we like to do is creating patterns and pattern making patterns, recognizing patterns, recognizing where a pattern starts and where a pattern ends and which part of the pattern repeats are all part of the curriculum. So if you've gathered rocks and twigs and flowers and stones and your child makes a pattern and then can repeat that pattern, that's practicing a really important part of the, of the math curriculum and it's fun and it's outdoors as well. Let's take a, a look at the next slide. I want to say something else about those patterns, actually. There's an artist named, uh, I believe it's Andrew Goldsworthy, but I'm going to get Susan. Maybe, Susan, you can check on that name. Remind me if I've said it correctly. He is an artist who does incredible things in nature where he creates patterns and pictures just in natural settings, and then he photographs them. And then basically, you know, they disintegrate over time. Um, but he's created these things in, in the most beautiful delicate and really detailed patterns. So if you have a chance, I'll double check on the name of the artist. You can check him out and use that Andy. That's it. Andy Goldsworthy. Thank you, Susan. Um, to, to look at inspiration. And I would, again, take it a step further. So if you've created this beautiful pattern, take a picture of it. Take a picture of it. Let the child take the picture of it from different angles and then um, share it with friends and family. Uh, post about it. You could even take a language component and write something about it. Get the child to write their artist statement in terms of why they chose those particular materials or why they chose that pattern or how it came about. But the trick here is to find ways of kind of blending all of these pieces together, the writing, the reading, and, and the math, and including science as well, so that it doesn't seem like it's curriculum-based or we must sit down and do this now. It's a much more natural and um, organic way of, of learning. All right, let's take a look about, talk about science. So again, if we're outdoors, tons of things that we can do out there. We can draw and label parts of bugs or flowers. We can do some research from a real book perhaps, if you have some reference books of plants and flowers, and then go outside and see if you can find them. Same thing with birds. You know, if you do some research about the types of birds that you might find in your backyard, and then you're lucky enough to see them, you could sketch a picture of it. You could talk about the colors. You could talk about a whole number of things, their habitat. You could have your child even create their own model of that bird using the information that they have found. Um, different aquatic habitats, ponds and creeks and lakes and all sorts of things have really interesting creatures in them that kids like love to get their hands into. Uh, you might even find a frog or some tadpoles and be lucky enough to hatch tadpoles and watch them in their habitat as well. Um, one of the things that we like to do is garden. And gardening is a fabulous way of bringing the curriculum into things. Again, you can talk about math in terms of the size of the garden plot, um, how much earth volume you might need in that garden plot. You can talk about the the growth and charting the growth of different plants. You know, if you check it once a week and you measure it, it's always exciting when you see change. And, you know, our youngest kids to our oldest kids really, and adults, react to that kind of change too. 
recording weather um, with drawings and words is another good idea, as well as looking at, you know, different components of bubbles. I love bubbles. Bubbles are like the simplest thing to do. There are some great recipes online for bubbles. My trick is that I put a little extra glycerin in the bubble solution because it makes them last longer and they are stronger. Um, so one of the things that we like to do is see how big the bubble can get and we use different materials to blow the bubbles. So there are, again, online lots of different tools that you can use, even using two tubes, empty tubes, and then a string, a cotton string that you tie in between. You dip the two tubes, they sort of stand as your structure, and you can make giant bubbles just by some homemade things that you've got around the house. Um, all right, any questions so far? No? Okay, let's keep moving. Let's see what else we've got. So let's talk about junior intermediate. So junior intermediate would be anywhere from uh, grade four all the way through to grade 10. However, I like to talk about sort of that grade four to eight um, realm as well. So let's look at language and learning outdoors. So for sure, you want to use your senses when you're outdoors. And if you are picking up on the, the smell of something, the sight, the texture, um, the sounds that are coming from a particular area, and you can get your child sort of in the, the perspective, from the perspective of a shrinking ant or a small, a small being, what would they see? How, what would they feel? What would they smell? Um, what would the sen their senses be like if they were shrunk down to the size of an ant? And you can have them write a paragraph about that. Um, again, we can talk about I spy games, but this time instead of doing rhyming or parts of the word, you can look at how things, how adjectives play a role. So I spy something that is fluff, fluffy, if you're talking about adjectives, maybe uh, if you're talking about adverbs, how I spy something flying rapidly, and it'll help our adults, our, our, you know, as parents, it'll help us to improve our vocabulary as well, but also to make sure that we're introducing our kids to, to varied language and to different ways of saying things as well. This is one of my favorites. Let's make a treasure map and write descriptive clues for the treasure. So kids get into this all the time. And what we need to do is encourage them to, uh, you know, create not just the words of the treasure map, but also create the map itself. Go around your property, go around the, if you're still in the house, you can use the house. If you're out in the garden or in a public park, you know, set parameters and let the kids go wild there. And my favorite part is when my daughter makes the treasure map and then I have to go and find the treasure. I mean, it works both ways, but, but depending on your kids and, uh, you know, you may want to do it both ways so that everybody gets a turn to be the hider of the treasure and the creator of the map and the follower of the map and the finder of the treasure. Um, let's see what else we've got. I say a tent. A tent, creating a tent is always a wonderful thing to do in the summertime. You can use a pop-up tent that you already have. You could just take a sheet and you know string it over two lawn chairs, but creating a, a quiet space where you can do some reading and you can really connect with each other, put some pillows in there, make it a really fun, cozy space. There's nothing better, you know? Even uh, if you are able to be out there at night and you can look at the stars, again, you know, using that reading nook or reading tent is something uh, that's bonding, I find really fun. Reading a novel with a summer setting, writing an extra chapter, writing a letter to a character, all great ideas in terms of keeping summer reading and language moving. You could also do a word of the day with your kids so that you have the practice of added vocabulary or perhaps a spelling pattern or um, you know, adding new words to a longer list as you go along. All right, any questions so far? Feel free, shout it out. Well, shout it out in the chat really. Give, uh, let's move on to the next one. So junior intermediate, we, those are our middle, middle school, middle age kids starting in grade four. And we want to talk about math, outdoor math. So again, if you're practicing multiplication or division, taking groups of items like flowers, notes, um, rocks, whatever you can find, and creating an array out of things um, is always a great 
game to play. And it's also a very good visual representation of how to multiply or how to divide. So an array, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's when basically you take, let's say we have the number sentence uh, four times three. So we would put four items going across in rows and three columns of, of those items. So three columns of four or, or three rows of four. Another way to do it is um, to look at, well, you can use sidewalk chalk. You can use all sorts of things outdoors to practice multiplication, including doing some type of a scavenger hunt for the questions. So you hide questions around the garden or outdoors, and then you have your kids collect them. And as they bring them to you, they have to give you the answer. And perhaps you can extend it by if they give you the correct answer, they get to go on to do something else. So there's the next level in the game. If they get an incorrect answer, they have to do something else. Um, you can really build that in with more physical activity where you might say, okay, I've hidden all of these multiplication questions around the garden and you're going to find them. When you find one, you bring it back to me, you tell me the answer, and then you get to take the basketball and try and get it through the hoop. So not only is it a scavenger hunt, but you've also added an element of, of a relay race or different components of, um, of a circuit that they have to go through. What else can we talk about? Place value. So place value is this idea of, uh, you know, having different value for each place in a question or a set of numbers or a value for the number. And we talk about units and or ones, we talk about tens, we talk about hundreds, thousands, and then we also talk about decimals. And um, one of the questions that I got earlier in the week was, my child has a really hard time with decimals, especially, you know, understanding the difference even between 3, 30, and 300. And even though they've looked at, you know, using the base 10 blocks, which are those counters that come in little cubes and then rods and then plates, um, it still doesn't make sense. So I was really thinking about this because this is a tricky one. We want, we try as best we can to make things as hands-on and visual for our kids as possible. That's the, the technique that seems to work best for us. And if you've used the counters and you've used um, other methods, you know, to show how the decimals will, um, how they relate to each other. One of the things I thought about was weight. And the idea of weight being, you know, if you have three of something versus 30 of something, holding them in your hand can show you the difference of, you know, how much the difference between three and 30 is or 30 and 300. So maybe getting it to be even more tactile or more hands-on might help that child understand the difference. Um, Let's talk about fractions. Oh my goodness, there are fractions everywhere. If you, again, take a set of objects and you want to say that two-sixths of the flowers are a certain color, you've got six flowers, two of them are yellow, and three of them are white, and one of them is uh, green, then we've got different ways of, of showing that fraction and also different ways of expressing that fraction. So you can talk about lowest terms, you can talk about... Um, the value of those things, how the fact that if you have a larger, the larger your denominator, so the higher your denominator, the smaller the piece of that pie is going to be. Um, and again, using sand or using dirt, mud pies, all of those things, anything that you can get your hands in would be a good idea. Let's talk a little bit about money. And I'm just going to check to see if there are any other questions. Nope, not yet. Let's talk about money. Money is a motivator. It's a big one. It's a good one. Uh, there are all kinds of things that you can do to promote place value and money, adding, subtracting, multiplying, estimating when you just talk about money. So one of the things is, of course, just to create a pretend stand or a, a grocery store or something that the child is selling or go for it and really make a lemonade stand and get out there. I mean, there are so many kids in the past who have created lemonade stands for charity and then donated the money to charity, but all of the steps involved to get there, including, you know, doing a cost analysis. So let's say I want to make a lemonade stand and I know that it is going to cost me $5 for a package of disposable cups. I mean, obviously, maybe in this time, people aren't going to be 
buying lemonade from kids on the street, perhaps, but we could still do a pretend lemonade stand and we could go through the motions. So we've got the cost of the cups. We've got the cost of the actual lemonade. Are you using real lemons versus are you using, you know, a powdered lemon drink? What is the cost difference if we use lemons versus the powder? Um, and all of this conversation is really stimulating the thought behind how do you estimate the cost of something? How do you actualize that cost? And of course, what is going to be the better deal? And then turning it around to figure out, well, how much do I have to charge? If if this cup of lemonade costs me a dollar, how much am I going to charge to recover my costs? But also if we're you know, trying to raise money for charity, uh, how much do I want to charge so that I can actually have something to donate after I've paid for my costs, et cetera. So all sorts of things that you can do for that. You can also keep a tally of how many people buy from you. Um, and that is another skill that is part of the curriculum, a very strong skill in terms of keeping track of something, keeping a chart for something as well as creating change and counting money. Um, you know, strange as it seems, one of my favorite pastimes as a kid was counting the jar of change that my parents had in their bedroom. And my sister and I would literally spend hours going through the change, sorting it out, putting it into piles. We even looked at the years on the coins and put them into piles of, of similar years. Um, it was always our our dream that we would find like a really ancient penny or something like that. And then we would, you know, be millionaires because it was worth so much, you know, something from the, I don't know, 1800s. We never did, never, never did. Um, let's talk about measurement again, planning and measuring. Perhaps you're going to build a gardening container or a garden plot. Um, and then we've got ideas, other ideas for building, building a cardboard playhouse or a real playhouse. If you've got some handy people in your household, um, anything that involves measuring that involves the planning, you can plot out on a grid and then, you know, all of those things are math skills that are really necessary and they're part of the curriculum, but are much more fun to do when you're actually creating something for yourself. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about science. Tons and tons of stuff to do for science. Uh, messy experiments are great outdoors. You know, there's the classic put a, a bottle of Coke and stick Mentos in it and watch it explode. It's quite spectacular, actually, depending on how many Mentos you put in there. Um, volcano, creating volcanoes out of baking soda and vinegar. Any other kinds of... Um, experiments, things that change color, things that change shape or form are really great to observe. And if you really want to go for it, you know, you can set up a template so that the kids are recording their observations as you go along so that it's much more scientific um, uh, as opposed to just the play part. One of the things that, um, that my daughter loves is the egg toss or the the competition of the egg drop and in that competition you have to create a structure or a container that will hold a raw egg now you could do it raw or if you want to you know have less mess you can um, boil the egg first but when we do it we go real we go raw egg all over the place if if it breaks so you're going to create a container that will hold the egg and you drop it at different heights maybe from a deck maybe from the top of the stairs and you see how far uh, the egg will be contained in this container without dropping. Again, a great competition for a family uh, or, you know, more than one family competing together separately and then comparing their data. Uh, but it's tons of fun. And it, it also will take a long time because you've got to experiment on which substances or which container will hold the egg the best, uh, what materials can you use, and these can be things in your house. You can use bubble wrap. You could use, um, you know, what did my daughter do last time? I think she wrapped it in bubble wrap, and then she wrapped it in fabric, and then she put um, styrofoam little, those styrofoam pieces around it, and then, you know, let it rip, and, and uh, she was successful. It did not break. Well, it broke after a while, but not from, uh, I think she got up to about eight feet, and it didn't break. What else can we do? Let's um, talk a little bit about instructions, writing and reading instructions for experiments. There are tons of experiments you can find online. And one of, one of the many skills that they promote is reading instructions clearly and carefully. That also promotes uh, executive functions of gathering the right information and following something in a sequential manner, step by step, as well as understanding um, that 
when you have a sequence, if you go out of sequence, you may not get the result that you're looking for. So it helps kids to slow down and to, to practice going one step at a time and reading those instructions a little more carefully. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. So now let's get to our older kids. And I know that our, our group has more younger kids, but I'm going to throw out a couple of answer, a couple of suggestions anyway for our senior kids, you know, let's say grade nine and above. Um, in terms of language, it's a hard one to motivate our older students to, to stay connected, you know, to stay writing and reading over the summer unless they already have a very strong um, affinity for reading and writing. But one of the things that we like to suggest is writing a script. So it's not, you know, an essay. It's not uh, doing research particularly for a very structured type of writing, but writing a script for a movie or a play. Um, you know, we've got all kinds of technological advancements. We can use our phones to create all sorts of special effects and things like that. So if a child has created um, a script for something and they can get siblings or neighbors with social distancing practices involved to, um, to record it, what a great thing. And then to practice editing it. I mean, there are all kinds of technical things that you can use just through um, iMovie and a bunch of other apps that are available online. I would say uh, writing some articles, contribute to a local newspaper or start your own community events news. You know, if you really want to be ambitious and, and you can help your kids to get motivated to write about their experiences um, and share it either online or in a, a community paper, it's a great way to share their ideas and also to motivate them to think of, think of things to, to do for themselves or things that are interesting for themselves. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about setting up a, a sequence or um, a circuit. And for our older kids, you know, if you set up a whole circuit of, okay, first you take the soccer ball and you weave it in and out of these pylons, and then you're going to take the basketball and you're going to put it through the hoop, and then you're going to, you know, jump through this hula hoop three times, etc. So you're setting up this whole circuit for them. Um, part of it is physical, but you can also have them practicing their spelling or or, um, vocabulary words or other, uh, you know, synonyms or antonyms. You can do a whole bunch of different things with language through the circuit that you've set up. Um, I would also say, you know, creating a business, and we're going to talk about that for our older kids, also in the math section. I just got uh, a flyer, an e-flyer from two kids, they're in high school, who are setting up a basketball what is it? It's, it's, they call it um, driveway basketball lessons. So these two teenagers will come to your driveway with social distancing practices in place. And for a fee, they will work one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, you know, two kids with one instructor to practice um, your basketball skills. And I think what a great way for these, you know, young, young adults to make some money, but also to be doing something that younger kids really enjoy and to help them build their skills. So they've been pretty ingenious in that. And uh, I, would I would encourage all of our high school kids to start thinking of things that they can do to help their community and perhaps earn a little bit of extra money for themselves too. Um, what else have we got? Setting up a reading hammock. I think, of course, like I said, there's nothing quite like reading on a some sunny, warm day outside in nature and uh, having that special place to go to on, on a moment's notice when you just need some chill time. Uh, another idea is sidewalk chalk poetry, which I think is so beautiful. And early on in, in the COVID um, at home, you know, once we've been locked down, my daughter set up a survey on the on the sidewalk with sidewalk chalk where she, you know, greeted the people that were walking by and she asked them questions, you know, how are you feeling today? And then she had three different symbols. Um, and we, we left the chalk outside. She wanted to leave it out there because she wanted to see if people would answer her. And I said, well, people may not pick up chalk, you know, that they don't know where it came from or who, who else was touching it, but we left it out there as an experiment anyway. And a few people did 
did leave their responses. Uh, we did not use that chalk afterwards. We left it out in the rain and eventually it melted. Uh, but she was very excited because she actually got some interaction with people from the community that she doesn't even know. And every morning she would kind of run out there to see if anybody else had left any more messages. So leaving messages of hope, leaving, you know, poetry, leaving uh, questions for people or just greetings, I think is a lovely, lovely thing to do. And that could be done at all ages. Um, and one of the last things we have on this slide is a recipe for a barbecue. So not just the recipes, but the whole, you know, plan a barbecue and let your teens do the planning. Let them figure out what recipes we're going to make. Let them figure out uh, what grocery list we need to to get to make it happen, um, maybe creating some new recipes. So again, the language part of it is in maybe writing their own recipe or their own lists of, of their to-do list, which definitely helps with executive functions and practicing keeping uh, things in order as well as planning and executing and completing a task. Um, but also the idea of the shopping list can be rolled into math as well. So if you set a budget, you know, of $50 for this family barbecue, what recipes can we use and what things do we need to, to shop for that we don't already have that fit within the budget. So again, I think as a parent, if you think more broadly about what learning is all about um, and that we can take our cue from the curriculum, but we can take it much farther and make everyday activities into learning moments, that's the best way to go. Let's look at the next slide. So when talking about senior learning and uh, math, then we're talking again about starting a neighborhood business and creating a budget for that business and, you know, how you're going to get the right materials and how, what the costs of those materials are going to be. Um, building is another one that we've talked about before. Uh, I really like this idea of creating a masterpiece by painting a mural where you take a grid. So you're taking a grid, you are creating a grid, and then you are enlarging an image proportionally. This is something that they do within the curriculum for usually grade eight, nine, sometimes into 10, where you take something and you blow it up. And when you blow it up, you have to look at the proportion of, um, you know, where one part of the drawing is on your small grid compared to where you're going to put it on your larger grid. Um, again, it doesn't have to be permanent. It can be sidewalk chalk, or you can get a big canvas and, and um, you know, work on that in the larger format. Again, we can do some planning and budgeting if we want to do a family outing or a trip, and we can get our kids to budget for gas, for snacks, to plan the route, to really take on, uh, again, even in that language department, taking on the responsibility of creating even uh, a brochure or a paragraph about the place that you're going to go. And then when you've been there, add some pictures, create a blog about it. And that way you're working in not only the planning and the um, the math side of things, but also the language side of things. All right. I'm doing a lot of talking. Anybody have any questions or any suggestions or any comments? Please feel free to put them in the chat box. Is there one thing, it would be great for me to have some feedback if there's one thing that you've heard today that you think, oh, that's really neat. I'm going to try that. What are some of those things that you might be willing to try or you think are possible for you to try for your kids this summer? I'm going to give you a moment to put that in the chat. Um, oh, you want to know who's doing the driveway basketball. All right. I can see what I can do. I, I will pass that along for sure. Uh, anybody else have things that they think, oh, maybe that would be something that I could actually do. Some of these things definitely involve a lot of planning and some don't involve much planning at all. Um, but it's keeping them in mind, kind of keeping the ideas in your back pocket so that when you are in a situation where it would be useful or helpful or possible to do those things, you've got them ready to go. All right. I'm going to give you a couple minutes. If I'd love, as I said, some feedback, if there's anything that you can uh, share with us in terms of some of the ideas that we've shared with you and what would make sense for you, that would be terrific. Let's move on to our next one. Oh, here's one. Let's see. What have we got? 
Um, community newspaper is very interesting. What about more digitally based video programming? Well, you know what? There are lots and lots of things that you can continue to do throughout the summer online. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing at Ruth Rumax Learning Space that, um, you know, you can look into as well. Um, the purpose of today's discussion was really about getting outside and putting the screens down for a, a period of time. But of course, you know, just because we're outside doesn't mean that we can't be using the techniques and the, and the, the tech that we have to enhance what we're doing there as well. Um, oh, you like the idea of teaching fractions with flowers. Thank you. I like that one too. All right, let's take a look. This next slide is just about treats. And oh my goodness, is summer not the best time for treats? Like that's my, my main pleasure in the summer is going for gelato. And I really, really hope that the gelato places that we frequent usually will be open for us to enjoy. What do you think? My husband's sitting over there. He's, he's nodding. He's saying, yeah, I hope so too. Um, so some of the treats that you can do at home, and again, reading recipes and creating, uh, creating fractions within a recipe or practicing how to take you know, a recipe and double it or triple it. These are all math ideas that are really useful when you're working with, um, with food, as well as looking at you know, how different foods connect together or in a science-based way, you know, acids and bases, or, uh, you know, if you're cooking with acid and oil, the fact that they, not acid, that that doesn't sound right at all. The fact that you're cooking with oil and with vinegar, for example, and the fact that they don't mix together. It's a great lesson on science and why some substances will create a solution and some will not. Um, so we've got different ideas for smoothies, for, you know, the barbecues, for ice cream, all kinds of stuff that we can do. Um, Nicole says, I like the idea of planning events like a barbecue or travel route to help with executive functioning. Also, lots of opportunities for recording steps and math calculations along the way. Totally. And the thing is, you know, as parents, sometimes it's sort of like when we want to slip in a little bit of learning, we have to do it in a bit of a sneaky way. And some kids are more wise to it than others. And we'll say, oh, no, I don't want to do, you know, don't make me add that. But if you're casual about it and it's kind of just part of the way that, you know, you're having the conversation, you slip it in sort of the way that we slip in vegetables for kids who don't really like to eat vegetables. We can be sneaky a little bit, but it also can become a family project. So it's not just here is a math question for you, John. This is actually a question for all of us. Well, dad, how would you solve it? Or brother, how would you solve this? And everybody gets a chance to put their two cents into it. Um, but I think giving kids that, that opportunity, which also becomes a responsibility, most kids will rise to that responsibility. And I, I said I would tell you what I'm doing with my daughter this summer. So she's going into grade six. She's had the same bed, which is a just a mattress on a box spring since she was three. And we decided that since camp was canceled and, you know, we were going to be around for most of the summer, that we would plan uh, a new bedroom makeover. And I explained that, you know, she's going to be responsible for a lot of it. She's going to have to do the budgeting. I gave her a very specific budget and said, this is it, whatever you want to buy, whether it's paint or a rug or a new bed frame or whatever it is, it's got to fit within this budget. Um, and she was super excited about it. She's been talking about it now every night as I put her to bed, she's telling me more and more of the things that she wants to get. And I said, fine, we're going to start a spreadsheet and we're going to put all of the wish list on that spreadsheet. We're going to do a little bit of online research and do the, the, um, the shopping. And you're going to have to remember that there will be tax on top of it. So she's going to practice calculating the tax as well as measuring her bedroom and figuring out what's going to fit and what's not going to fit. Um, you know, the, the ceiling height and how high she can put her bed because she wants a loft bed, uh, all sorts of things. So as we go along, you know, the, the possibilities are really endless in terms of how we can transfer that exciting um, building of a new room or the room makeover and really work in some of these curriculum ideas that will serve her for an enormously long time, all of her life. You know, to know how to budget something, to know how to calculate tax or how to calculate a discount are things that are skills that need to be with us for our lifetime. 
So if we can do it in a fun way, we've got, um, you know, we've got a leg up in terms of engaging our kids and keeping them engaged and also showing them how math can be useful to them in, in the future, not just, you know, as part of the curriculum. Okay, let's take a look at our next slide. So I said that I would tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Ruth Remax Learning Space in terms of summer programming. And we've got tons of things that we're doing. So, you know, as we've moved online and typically our programs would be face-to-face, -face, uh, either one-to-one -one, or they would be doing, we would be doing group classes, which are small groups up to 12 kids. But of course, this summer we have to be more innovative and, and take things off of the face-to-face -face and move them online. So. Currently, all of our one-on-one -on -one is, is online, and we've already started to do uh, some group classes online. This is our summer offering. We have a whole bunch of new math courses um, for our older kids, so kids going into grade 9, going into grade 10, 11, and 12. We, the two for grade 9 and 10 are really centered around um, reviewing the, the main curriculum needs going into that grade. So if you are a grade eight student going into grade nine, that would be appropriate. And you would be practicing and reviewing the things that you would need for grade nine. If you were a grade nine student who did not feel confident with the grade nine curriculum, or you feel you need a refresher, that course might be um, appropriate for you as well. The older two courses, the crash course for grade 11 and grade 12, those are going to be done uh, lecture style. So they're going to move faster with less teacher interaction. Our two math courses for the younger kids are going to be uh, live teacher with interaction and homework and feedback and all sorts of things. So there's a difference there for our older kids and the slightly younger ones. Um, we've got a full day camp, which seems strange to be offering online, but our teachers have been very clever and we've broken it down into a morning and an afternoon. And in the morning, you have a choice of one academic program and one active program where we'll be doing yoga or um, doing a fitness class or doing sports related games and activities. And the same thing in the afternoon where we'll offer a, an academic portion and an active portion, maybe some arts and crafts and hands-on activities, some of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, we've also got uh, keyboarding classes for grades 3 through 12. We've got writing classes for starting with paragraphs, moving on to essays, and then research essays. Executive functioning, our class, which is all about keeping it together and knowing how to plan and prioritize and execute, as well as note-taking, will be uh, offered over the summer as well as our book clubs, which I'm really excited about. This is the first time we're offering book clubs, and we have three of them running grades four to six, seven to 10, and 11 to 12, where we are really going to dive into a book. It's going to encourage your kids to keep reading over the summer, to create a, a community of readers, to share their excitement about the story, and uh, we will do it in, in a very fun way. It will not be you know, the same way that they do a novel study in school. There will be much more discussion and lots of kind of in-depth digging into the, the background of the book as well. And last but not least, we have our uh, test preparation classes that are available, our SSAT, SAT classes as well. And we're just looking forward to a whole bunch of new things going on over the summer. Even though we can't see our kids face to face in person, we're going to be sharing lots of wonderful strategies and tips and, and tools for our students in order to prepare them for next year. So I'm going to go back to Nicole says that my daughter is used to writing with a lot of structure and support, but I want her to start keeping a journal over the summer. How can I do this without tossing structure out the window and having her refer back, refer back to phonetic spelling? I don't want to reinforce the wrong, but I want her to keep writing. That is a great question, Nicole. Thank you for that. Because there's this toss up, you know, between... Well, if I ask my kid to write something and I want her to enjoy it and do it for pleasure, then I shouldn't be standing over her shoulder and correcting every other word. Um, and this is the balance of the parent where we have to look at, all right, are there, there are certain words, you know, at a certain grade level, let's say a grade four level, that a child should know how to spell on a regular basis correctly. Um, and in fact, online, there are many sort of lists by grade of what what are the common words or the, the sort of target words for spelling for each grade. 
So you may want to look at it that way and choose one or two words or three words a week that you're focusing on that you want her to really um, hone in on. And that's where you can use some of those other games and activities like getting her to do a scavenger hunt around the, the garden find the words and then practice writing them in sand or writing them in shaving cream so that she's practicing them in a different way than just writing them down like a dictation. Um, and then you want to encourage her to, or, or give her a challenge. How many of these words can you use in your journal? And, you know, practicing, of course, the, the correct spelling. So it is a toss up. Um, you know, we don't want to overburden the student with corrections because then it won't be fun at all. But if we can focus on maybe a few words at a time that you're expecting her to be able to spell consistently, then it will give her a framework um, and something, you know, an expectation to live up to without taking the enjoyment away from it as well. I hope that helps, Nicole. Uh, Michael says, maybe something to take offline, but I'm curious if I would, if you would ever consider executive functioning for grade five and six. I feel the strategy needs to be implemented earlier. Oh, Michael, so do I, so do I. And in fact, executive functions, we did a whole workshop on executive functions a few weeks ago. And if you're interested, um, it should probably, it's probably up on our YouTube channel, uh, which is a perfect time for me to say, please find our YouTube channel, which is Ruth Remax Learning Space and subscribe and take a look at what we have to offer there. Not only are there past webinars that we have done online, but there's also a lot of clips um, or small segments from breakfast television where I'm a host, or not a host, I'm a guest often, as well as some other um, new shows as well. So take a look, there may be some more things in there. Um, however, executive functions are things that start to develop early, but will continue to develop, to develop until uh, an individual is 25 years of age or older. And the research you know, that I was doing 10 years ago on executive functions uh, was saying that they, they, they tend to develop by about age 25. Now I'm reading that they don't really fully develop until 28 or 30. So these are things that we need to start modeling and practicing with our kids early. And you're right, grade five or six would be a great time to do it. Um, what I find is that there's there are only so many pieces of that puzzle that we can introduce to a student at once. And they need time to assimilate them and to practice them. They need to see them in action. They need to be able to reflect on what's working and what's not working. But of course, the grade five and six kids that we work with on a regular basis, we involve and incorporate executive functions really from the very beginning, even in grade one where there are appropriate things that you can do. You know, part of executive functions is keeping track of your stuff. So knowing that you put your jacket back on this hook and you put your, you know, papers back in this folder at the end of the day, these are things that we can be doing from a very young age. And when we work one-on-one -on -one with our students, we certainly do uh, practice those skills and we, we embed those skills in the work that we do with our kids on a regular basis. So for you, Michael, who are, you know, you're looking at kids who are in grade five and grade six, we, we do do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. For our group classes, however, we have decided to um, concentrate them starting in grade seven uh, because this was the greatest need that we were seeing. But we do definitely offer it for younger kids. And we can put together a personalized small group class for any, uh, any students that want to work together. We call it Bring Your Own Group, BYOG, where if you have a certain set of criteria or curriculum that you would like to concentrate on and you bring us three, four, five kids, we can put the curriculum together for them uh, or tweak a curriculum that we are already using. So yes, offline, I would love to talk to you. And if you want to stick around um, till after the presentation, then we can continue to chat too. All right, let's look at our next slide. What have we got? I think we're coming to the end. So this is just a little bit more about our book clubs. And uh, I was saying earlier, I'm really excited because it's the first time we've offered a book club, but we've wanted to for so long. And I think the online format is going to be perfect for it because you can, you know, join us for the 45 minutes of the book club um, and then go off and do your reading on your own. There will be a couple of, you know, little assignments to do, but it's really going to be on the enjoyment side and really digging deeper into that book, as I was saying earlier. Um, and being able to build a community of readers. I mean, my goodness, what an awesome thing to find like-minded individuals who are in your age group that are reading the same thing and that are interested in it as much as you are. All right, let's look at the last slide. I think we're, I think we're at the end. Here are the takeaways. 
So one of, you know, some of the things that I really hope that you, you leave tonight's presentation with are, is the fact that there are many, many ways to keep the learning going that are less structured and that are outdoors. And so many of the recommendations that I made today can actually be done inside as well. You don't have to have a big open space to do it. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to teach the curriculum in that, you know, the summer we've had enough stress. My goodness, we've all had enough stress. And I think that at this point, we want to keep the learning going, but we want it to be engaging and we want the kids to enjoy it as much as, much as they can. Um, and find those little moments of, of teaching, teaching moments that you can incorporate into your everyday into your everyday life and, and into your everyday activities. Um, if you can squeeze in one math activity and one literacy or language activity a day, you know, you'll, you'll be doing really well. And if you can do a couple of those a week, you'll also be doing really well. I think the idea is just to keep things interesting and not, uh, not revert to having our kids be on screens and be stuck indoors all summer. Um, always include outdoor treats for motivation and that keeping in mind summer learning should be fun and you as a parent should have fun with it too. I mean, I'm very excited about doing my daughter's uh, bedroom makeover. That's because it's kind of my, my interest and my passion uh, to look at interior design and, and how to make things look pretty. So we're going to work on it together, but really she's going to take the lead and that's, I've given her the parameters and we're going to work within those. Um, that's really, I think, what I want to say for tonight. And if you have any other questions, we're going to stick around. I'll be, I'll be here to chat. Um, if you would like me to, if you want to do a face-to-face -face or a talk, you can certainly give us a call at 416-925-1225. That's the phone number. Let us know what you're looking for. Or if you've got any further questions, we can set up a phone call. Um, of course, as I said, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can see the other webinars that we've done. Uh, we are also on Instagram and on Twitter and all those social media outlets. You will find us. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. And if not, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really a pleasure to share all of these ideas and strategies and tools with each of you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on our list of attendees again. We do these talks every Tuesday from seven to eight. And every week it's a different theme or a different topic. Um, and again, we welcome your recommendations or, or your suggestions to keep things going and to build a community of parents that support each other. That's really the goal here. So if there are no questions, I will bid you a good evening and hope to see you again soon. Take care. <laughs>